Hello friends, what would you feel if you were asked to eat what you have never eaten in your life? That was a test Peter, a devout Jew, was confronted with. To him, there are certain food that are not just disgusting, but forbidden by the Mosaic law. It was God's idea of preparing him for something he had never imagined. That was accessibility of grace and salvation to the Gentiles. Let us witness Peter's first meeting with Cornelius, a Gentile from Caesarea. I warmly welcome you, brothers and sisters, for joining me in yet another session of digging and meditating on the Word of God. We have so far seen Ananias being with Saul and the later sightlessness out of the blinding light on the way to Damascus being made well. He was also right away filled with the Spirit and received baptism. Saul confounded the Jews in Damascus by preaching in their synagogue about the very Messiah whose very disciples he intent to harm. As he has kept the first attempt to his life by the Jews in Damascus, he joined the apostles in Jerusalem through Barnabas. There too, since the Grecian Jews sought for his life, he was sent to Caesarea and on to Tarsus. We then saw Peter's ministry in Lydda and Joppa, miraculously healing Aeneas, who was bedridden for eight years and sick with palsy. Later, also raising Dorcas from the dead. Dear friends, as God mercifully blessed the works of His servants, I welcome you to yet another session of Bible study through the book of Acts. Acts 10 verse 1 At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. Remember that Paul had been in Caesarea, and probably some of the other apostles had been preaching the gospel along the coast. Tel Aviv is really a part of old Joppa. As one travels up the coast from Joppa, the next place of any size is Caesarea, which was really a Roman city. It was the place where Pilate lived. The governor and those who ruled the land stayed there. This is where Cornelius was stationed. He was a centurion, which means he was a commander of a hundred soldiers in the Roman army. The Italian band was a cohort of Roman soldiers recruited in Italy. Verse 2 now. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. He was a devout man. That means his worship was rightly directed. He recognized his dependence upon that which is divine. Well, those who do not know Christ personally sometimes have greater devotion and deep conviction. Sometimes we wish that our brothers and sisters would have more devotion and conviction. Cornelius was a devout man and one that feared God. He was not a Jewish proselyte in the strict sense of the term, but gravitated toward Judaism and could be called a proselyte of the gate. Today we might say that he was a man who lived in the neighborhood, probably attended church on several occasions, was friendly toward the people but was not actually a believer. That could have been Cornelius, somebody who had reverence or feared God. He gave alms to the people means that he gave many gifts of charity to the Jewish people. The nation Israel has always laid great stress upon giving. God had taught them in the Old Testament we speak of the tithe, but it is obvious from the mosaic system that they actually gave three tenths. 
they gave for the running of the government, which was a theocracy at the beginning, by the way. And uh, they also gave for the maintenance of the temple. And they gave a tenth of all that they produced. So they have been a giving and a generous people. Cornelius prayed to God regularly. This centurion took his needs to God. He needed to have more light. He wanted it. He probably didn't really know too much about prayer, but he prayed. Verse 3 now. One day at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, now remember, this centurion was an officer in the Roman army, a career officer and a man of influence. He had tremendous influence on his own household, as we shall see. He was a good man to all outward observation. Here is an example of a man who lived up to the light which he had. John chapter 1 verse 9 says this of Jesus. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. This centurion had not met Jesus Christ nor come into his presence, but he was living up to the light that he had. Paul is referring to those who do not live by the light. They have in Romans 1, 19-20, it says, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. This is God's answer to the often repeated question, what about people who do not know or haven't heard about the gospel? How will they be reached? But God never had a chance? Is they, are they lost? The answer is that God will get light to such a person. God will enable them to hear the gospel. Now, how will God get the gospel to Cornelius? The barriers seem great. The church at this time and for the first eight years, it was exclusively Jewish. These Christian Jews were still going to the temple and observing many Jewish customs. They could do that under grace because they were trusting Christ. Then the gospel broke over into Samaria. The Jews in Jerusalem were surprised, but they recognized that the hand of God was in this. Now, how is God going to open the door to the Gentiles? Paul is to be the great messenger to the Gentiles, but God has Paul out in the desert in Arabia, training him. It is Simon Peter who is like the forerunner who must open the door to the Gentiles. God used perhaps the most prejudiced and uh, tough person, the greatest extremist of that day. Obviously, the Holy Spirit directed every move in getting the gospel to the Gentiles. My friend, all genuine work that is of God is directed by the Holy Spirit. No other work amounts to anything. The Holy Spirit had to work in the heart of the Gentile. The Holy Spirit also had to work in the heart of the Jew, and it was Peter. The Holy Spirit directed the bringing of the gospel to the Gentile world. Verse 4, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. An angel of God appeared to Cornelius in a vision. He was not dreaming but was given this vision while he was praying. Now, I want you to notice that there are certain things that do count before God. 
There are things which can in no way merit salvation, but they are things which God takes note of. The prayers of Cornelius and his arms had come up as a memorial before God, and God brought the gospel to him. Wherever there is a man who seeks God as Cornelius did, that man is going to hear the gospel of the grace of God. God will see that he gets it. Verse 5 The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner whose house is by the sea. The angel tells him where to find Peter. He doesn't need more of an address. The whiff of those hides down in that area will definitely lead them to the right place. Verse 7 now. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. As we said earlier, these men wouldn't have any trouble finding the tanner's house, would they? While they are on the way, God must prepare Simon Peter. Now let's observe what happened with Simon Peter, verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the rooftop to pray. It is absolutely necessary for God to prepare Simon Peter. You probably would have heard this famous saying, prayer changes things. Well, sometimes things don't change, but he sure changes those who pray. You see, Simon Peter didn't have the breadth that Paul had. Although he didn't have the background or the training that Paul had, God can use him differently. I believe it is a tremendous mistake to think that every person has to be poured into the same mold for God to use. Now verse 10. He became hungry, now this is Peter, and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Well, this shows how hungry he was. He was having dreams of all kinds of animals. Notice that there were beasts, all kinds of birds, and all kinds of bugs. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. This is verse 13. And listen to how Peter replied, Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. While Peter is wondering what this means, uh, a voice speaks to him. Isn't it interesting that he actually calls him Lord, but he doesn't want to obey what the Lord tells him to do. Now don't miss this. Here is a man who is on this side of the day of Pentecost. He is living in this age of grace when it makes no difference whether we eat meat or whether we don't eat meat. However, Peter is still abiding by the mosaic system and he is not eating anything that is ceremonially unclean. He is sincere and honest about it. Someone may say that he ought to be broad-minded and eat everything. Well, you see, that the Lord is teaching him. He is in the process. And he is no longer under the mosaic system. And he is free to eat anything. Verse 15 now. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. What God has made clean don't you call unclean. You can eat anything because God has said so. Verse 16. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. 
Peter was left wondering what it was all about. Verse 17, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius find out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Verse 18, they called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. Verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Verse 21, Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Simon Peter is to go to Caesarea. This little delegation from Cornelius gives an explanation to him, then extends an invitation to come with them to the house of Cornelius. Verse 23 Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. We can see that Cornelius had quite an influence on his family and friends. He has called them together for this occasion. Also, we can see that Cornelius is still not having a good understanding of Christ or his message. When he is instructed by an angel to send for Simon Peter, he concludes that this man must really be important. So he falls down and worships Peter. It's interesting to see Simon Peter's reaction to this. Friend, Simon Peter would never have let you get down to kiss his feet. He just wouldn't permit it. Verse 26. But Peter made him get up, stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. When Peter makes the statement, I am only a man, he's letting him know that he is just like anybody else. He is not super spiritual, he is not set apart above the others, but he is like anybody else. Man with sin, man with struggles, man with problems. Peter reached down and pulled him up to his feet and said, Stand up! I myself also am a man. I like the way he did that. Verse 27 Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Peter stepped into the house. What a step that was. It was the very first time that Peter had ever been in a Gentile house. He is still really a little baffled at the way God has been directing him. He violates the first rule of homiletics when he begins his message with an apology. What he says is not a friendly thing to say. In fact, it is an insult. In a sense, he just said, If you really want to know how I felt about this, well, I just didn't want to come. I have never been in the home of a Gentile before. Never before have I gone into a place that is unclean. But he goes on to add, Even though I have never been there before in an unclean home, God has directed me, God has commanded me, God has told me not to call any man unclean. We are all sinners and we are all savable. How would you feel especially if you are a housekeeper, if some visitor came into your home and his first words were, I am coming into your home, which I consider dirty. 
you wouldn't exactly respond with a warm, friendly feeling, would you? Yet this is the substance of what Simon Peter said. But because God had showed him that there was neither clean nor unclean, he continues his message. Verse 29, So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask, why you sent for me? This amazes me. Would Simon Peter ask that question? Why didn't he immediately begin to tell them about Jesus Christ? Well, you see the Spirit of God is in charge here. And he keeps Simon Peter from rushing right into this. Remember, Simon Peter is usually the one who always does the talking. He wouldn't wait for somebody else. But here we feel see Simon Peter actually waiting. He listens to what they have to say. This should be an important lesson for us. So often we are rather brisk and hasty and even crude in the way we tell others about Christ. Because we find it difficult to tell others, generally when we do it, we are very amateur about it and we go about it abruptly and in such a way that it often offends people. Dear friend, we need to be led by the Spirit of God. I mean that we should begin by praying for an individual. Notice how Cornelius and Peter, both of these individuals, were actually praying when God started to work in their life. And then things happened. Ask God to lead you. Friend, I know that he will definitely lead. And he will also prepare the person who is going to hear. If you have been praying for a loved one or a friend or a stranger, don't just go to him in your own strength and in the power of the flesh. If you do, you will fail. Let God be the one to direct you. We have always been told to speak up for Christ. But let's remember before we do speak, it's more important for us to be silent, to be prayerful, to be observant and listen to the person God leads us to. Dear friends, I hope we are all thrilled by the lesson we studied today. As we wind up, few reminders that will do us great good are, first, God loves the whole world. As such, we are to be careful against overlooking or showing contempt to those different from us. Secondly, the humility of Peter is a big lesson for our generation today. He was not tempted a little to enjoy the attention and worship that was due only to God. Thirdly, it is never wise to rush into witnessing. Instead, we are to wait on the Holy Spirit for wisdom and direction. Thank you for staying true, and I hope to see you again in our next study. God bless you. Mm -hmm.